Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Hi everybody, I'm Jeremy Corder, Peter Clayton behind the camera. Welcome to the garage and the court of public opinion. Pete, that smell of petrol is starting to worry me. Yes, well I think we've identified it's the Mercedes. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just running a bit rich. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I've got the fire extinguisher over there just in case. But you know, it always worries me. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Look, I thought... Um, Thank you for all the comments that you make about the show. I'm very grateful. I'm a couple of days behind in responding to you, so forgive me. Uh, there's been a bit on lately. Uh, but um, Louise sent me this. <laughs> Can I read this quickly? Uh, One day, a florist went to a barber for a haircut. After the cut, he was asked about the bill, the hairdresser, that is. And the barber replied, I can't accept any money from you. I'm doing community service this week. The florist was pleased and left the shop with his brand new haircut. And when the barber went to open his shop the next morning, there was a thank you card and a dozen roses from the florist waiting for him at the door. Later, a cop comes in for a haircut. And when he tries to pay the bill, the barber again replies, I can't accept any money from you, sir. I'm doing community service this week. The cop was very happy, checked himself out in the mirror, and left the shop. The next morning, when the barber went to open, there was a thank you card and a dozen donuts waiting for him at the door. Then a member of Congress came in for a haircut. And when he went to pay the bill, the member of Congress, that is, the barber again replied, I can't accept any money from you. I'm, I'm doing community service this week. The member of Congress was very happy and left the shop. The next morning, when the barber went to open up, there were a dozen members of Congress lined up waiting for a free haircut. <laughs> And that, my friend, illustrates the fundamental difference between the citizens of our country and the politicians who run it. If you don't forward this on, you have no sense of humour. <laughs> well, I, this is my way, my darling, of forwarding it on. <laughs> no, I agree with you. That's terrific. Thank you. Uh, this is not so terrific, is it? 53 people massacred in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Now this is a, a, a violent, tribal, lawless society, particularly in the highlands. Modern weapons have replaced the bow and arrow. They even used poison, uh, blow darts and things like that, and of course spears. But where are these modern weapons coming from? Some of these clans have been warring with each other for generations. Now, most were headhunters, cannibals, just a few years ago. It was a very primitive country, still is in some parts, and just a few kilometers separate our two countries. You can actually see Papua New Guinea from the tip of Cape York Peninsula. It's about four or five kilometres away. On a clear day you can see it quite easily. But even closer to PNG is Westeria, across a much contested border with Indonesia. Now my guess, without being too Machiavellian, is that these modern self-loading automatic weapons are coming across 
that border. These guns are expensive. These tribes, people couldn't possibly afford to buy them. But in the interests of destabilizing this already unstable country, the guns, I would suggest to you, are probably being donated. What we have here is another proxy war, I suggest. The truth is that we were forced by the United Nations to grant this country independence. They were a dependent of Australia for years and years and years and years. And the history of Papua New Guinea and Australia during the Second World War was wonderful with the Coast Watchers and the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful history if you want to delve into it. But that independence should never have been forced upon them. They were not prepared. They're still not prepared. They're not independent. For them to be so close to Australia, vulnerable, and politically and socially unstable, Papua New Guinea is a sitting duck for China, Indonesia, or anyone else who might turn up and we find ourselves with someone on our doorstep too close for comfort. I remember my uncle David Littlemore who spent a lot of time in Papua New Guinea, did a lot of work with Qantas in the early days, building hangars and things like that. When I say building, he designed them. Fascinating stories about the place. There was a thing called the cargo cult. I'm not even sure that there still isn't a thing called the cargo cult. The natives would see a confusing glimpse of the modern world. Port Moresby Airport. They would gather around, squatting on the ground, watching the silver birds fly in and give these white people gifts from the sky, boxes, cargo, hence the name of the cargo cult. To the natives, this was, well, clearly the way to go. <laughs> no hunting, no gathering. That's too hard. All we need to do is to clear a nice big piece of land and wait, and wait, and wait. And then, hey, what are we doing wrong? Those silver birds. This is what the white guys do. You know, they're wearing clothes. We're much more interesting. We're stark naked. After much thought, they decided that the big silver birds filled with gifts were attracted to the clearing, that is the airport, because there were other birds sitting on the ground. So they, the big silver birds in the sky would know that it's safe to land. So the natives then spent hours making mock aeroplanes, models out of sticks and branches and paper and cloth. It was a major problem. They would spend days, weeks, months just sitting on the ground waiting, 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 waiting. And when you think about it, their, their thinking was perfectly logical. Just no understanding of a more complicated world that existed just beyond theirs. And not very much has changed in Papua New Guinea. We'll see where all of this goes. I don't know if it's going to be a happy place. I wonder if all these uh, climate people you know, the ones who want to get rid of gas and coal. I wonder if they've spoken to any of the chefs of the world. You know, not even great chefs, just household chefs. And of course, all the wonderful restaurants and restaurateurs around the world, all of whom would never think of using anything other than gas in the kitchen. What exactly are you going to do with them? I don't really know. It's amazing. 
Let me just tell you quickly about Jim Elder. As you know, he is looking for paintings for his upcoming March and April auctions. The Jim Elder Fine Art Gallery, one of our sponsors here in the Court of Public Opinion, he's calling for entries in these forthcoming auctions, which are not only seen around the world, but people are actively bidding from around the world. If you have a painting, a noted Australian or international artist, uh, and I wouldn't know a noted international artist or an Australian art. I, you know, I know a handful of famous names. We all do. But uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. And Jim Elder is an absolute connoisseur. He will come along and give you a no-obligation appraisal and tell you how much this painting is worth, at which point in time you can say, oh, I didn't know that. I'm going to keep it. In fact, I'm going to put it in pride of place in my home or I'm going to sell it because, hell, I need the money and I don't need the painting. Could be worth thousands. I don't know. Jim and Helen Elder and their beautiful art gallery, 106 Melbourne Street, North Adelaide. They're open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. All you need to do is call Jim on 8267 2869 or you can call him on his personal cell phone, his mobile phone, 04 one seven eight one 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 eight four and you just never know till you ask give Jim a call let him know I suggested that you uh, you ring you remember the uh, 149 detainees the illegal immigrants held in detention some were murderers seven of them in fact rapists paedophiles dangerous people in fact dangerous people held in indefinite detention, and quite rightly so, because their country of origin wouldn't take them, and no other country would either. And who would blame them? Well, it turns out that well before the High Court handed down its decision, turning loose, mind you, only one of those detainees, the Labor government was told by the Attorney General's department that they would probably lose the case. Plenty of time to prepare new legislation to be prepared, just in case. But here's the kicker. Andrew Giles, the minister in charge, was overseas campaigning for Labour's voice instead of doing his job which is keeping Australia safe and you might be interested or in fact alarmed to hear that of the 149 detainees who were set free 18 have gone on to commit more crime and the government is very vague about how many are being monitored and how they're being monitored and where they are. I hope you'll forgive me for thinking that the law, while upholding people's rights, as it should do, has a greater responsibility to keep our streets safe and our citizens safer. And I don't think these people, quite frankly, have all that many rights to uphold. But then again, that's just me. 3.2 billion dollars to build a new children's hospital here in Adelaide, a new women's and children's hospital. Now this, in contrast to the existing Royal Adelaide Hospital, this makes this build the most expensive hospital ever and the most expensive building ever. Believe it. Why? There is a huge community investment in the old hospital. Now something smells wrong here. They also fear that delays, ah, uh, look, it could be just a scare campaign, I don't know, but the government is suggesting that 
Any delays will cost the taxpayer $10 million a month. So let's get this show on the road. What are they doing? Building monuments to themselves? Who authorized this crock of nonsense? Importantly, where is the impotent Liberal Party? Then on top of all of this, we've got the relocation of the greys, the police horses. Millions and millions and millions of dollars that we don't need to spend. What's behind all of this? There has never been, to my knowledge, one single story about the inadequacy of the old women's and children's hospital, which ain't that old. What is going on here? And where is the opposition? And where is the media? Hmm. How much time have I got, Pete? Well, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me, how, Pete, you're into football. Yes. How much is a footballer worth? Well, some of them are worth millions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. The question I was going to ask is, are footballers worth a million dollars a year? Well, I guess the advertisers, uh, the, the people that support the programs. A million dollars a year? I know, year? I know. Their argument is that their career is short. Unless they go on to media. They've only got so many years to make their money out of their sport. But Gee. Uh, if they're not generating the income, I guess they couldn't get that money. Oh, look, I don't resent anybody's big salary. I really don't. But remember also, apart from the million dollar a year players, the administrators of the game are paid even more. But here's another one. A lollipop person. That's somebody on a building site or the side of the road you know, with the stop and go, the stop go people, lollipop sign, they are now paid $120,000 a year to stand there. $120,000 a year. Yet we'll argue about doctors and nurses. And we'll make the nurses have to go out and, and pay for their own parking and come back across parkland sometimes in the middle of the night and teachers, and the police, and truck drivers. I don't know where our priorities are. I really don't. Um, have I got time to do a couple of dates? I dropped them. Pete? Well, you might have to be quick, Jeremy. You want me to be quick? All right. All right. Let me just give you a few dates and mention that we'll be on the air from the dining room table tomorrow. We will. February 22nd, George Washington, 1732. I got a picture of George Washington over there on the wall, and he is crossing the Delaware. Most famous painting. It's not the real thing, mind you. It's a it's a knockoff of the. It's a real painting, but it's a knockoff of the uh, very famous picture of Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, anyway, I'm very proud of that. American founding father, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during the War of Independence. He's the first president of the United States, 1789 to 97, born Westmoreland, Virginia. 1732 on this day. One more? Okay. 2002, Charles Chuck Jones, American animator and cartoonist, best known for his work with Warner Brothers. He did Bugs Bunny. What's up, Doc? He did Daffy Duck. <laughs> he did Wile E. Coyote. He did The Roadrunner. He did Porky Pig. And what was the... Uh, what was the... Um, I'll say, I'll say. <laughs> I say, I say. I say, I say. Oh, Foghorn Leghorn. Yeah. Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> that boy's Foghorn. as sharp as a bowling ball. That, boy, that boy's as sharp as a bowling ball. <laughs> I love him. Do you reckon we could get Foghorn Leghorn to do some <laughs> artificial intelligence voices for us on the show? Uh, I think that could be wonderful. Yeah, look, uh, we'll leave it there because uh, the battery's almost dead. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'll just 
conclude by wishing you a happy birthday or happy wedding anniversary and invite you most sincerely to join us at the dining room table tomorrow, nine o'clock. I haven't got much planned, so we'll just do it free form and see where it all leads us. Tomorrow morning, jeremycordo.com live streaming, three hours. We'll take your calls, we'll have guests, we'll have fun, but most importantly, hopefully, we will have you. Thank you for viewing the Court of Public Opinion. I'm Jeremy Cordo, Peter Clayton, and I'll be back. Believe in yourself, and goodbye for now. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.